welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is a spine chilling tale. I hope you all enjoy as much as I. As ever, please do let me know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share and help build the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. Big, big shout to the author V. Halsham for this wonderful, wonderful chilling tale. Please do take time to check out their wonderful Reddit and uh, some more spine tingling towels to lose yourself in for hours and hours. If you yourself have a creepy true story or possibly a fictional one, please do get it over to me at dmtforestoffear.com. Without further ado, let's get into tonight's story entitled. There is something living in Flathead National Forest, and it isn't human. Let's get straight into that. It started over 20 years ago when my family bought a farm. A cozy little house off the Highway 206. A little out the way for privacy, but close enough to town for emergencies. My dad loved it called it his little piece of heaven. It shares the border with the Flathead National Forest and I spend a lot of my free time climbing trees and building forts. In the winter, I dig snow tunnels from the house to the woods with various huts in between. It was everything a kid could ask for. We had only been there for two growing seasons when my mother started acting strange. She kept saying that something was watching her at night from the forest. Something she couldn't see but she knew it was there. My dad didn't believe her at first and, well, neither did I. I had spent so much time in these woods that I would have known if something was there. She was adamant though, and it got to the point where she didn't go outside after two in the afternoon. She said it was because that's when the shadow started to reach out from the depths of the trees. Her condition grew so bad that my dad was calling in doctors to check on her, but they weren't any help. She moved down to the basement and we had to take food down to her. Food that would go uneaten and spoil. She refused to sleep and I could hear her at night talking to nothing, muttering about what she thought was out there. Dad had moved me into his room after she moved to the basement. At that time saying it was because he didn't like being in a big room by himself. It wasn't until later that I realised it was because he feared for my safety. Dad and I woke up to an extreme chill one winter morning, like the furnace had been off for days sort of cold. I remember hearing the front door creaking and Dad grabbed his gun. He told me to stay put while he went to take a look. He shouted when it was all clear and I followed his voice to the living room. Every window and door was open and my mother was gone. Dad made a mad rush to relight the furnace, worried that the pipes had had a chance to freeze and would burst. I was in charge of closing the windows and doors. He was downstairs when I found a bloody shard of glass on the porch and a trail of red footprints leading towards the forest. Mum had finally lost her mind. Dad called the cops and a search party was formed. It looked for three days, even calling in a forest service to do an aerial sweep of the area. Everyone came up empty-handed. The sheriff didn't seem surprised that we didn't find her and my dad was furious that he was given up so soon. Sometimes the forest takes what it wants, and most of the time it doesn't give it back. It's the way it's always been. It's the only thing I remember him saying before he packed up the rest of his gear and left. My dad drank heavily for a long time after that. The light that had been his life was now extinguished, and he was just going through the motions. The harvests were good though. We go out every fall and harvest the hay and the chamomile. Dad continued to drink, but there was money coming in, and we bought some cows and chickens. He didn't start to lose it until I went to college on the other side of the state. I didn't realise how bad he had gotten until the sheriff called me one night, asking me to come home to see him. Apparently, Dad had driven down to the bar, gun in hand, and started shouting about getting even with the bastard that took his wife. I let my department head know, and drove home at 3am in a panic. 
He didn't look like the dad when I picked him up at the station. His face was gaunt. His eyes were wild. His hands and coat were covered in blood, the origin of which I would discover when I took him home. The chickens were dead. He said it had come for him. It had come from the woods and was tall and pale with, with distended limbs with multiple joints. When he had seen it, he thought it had been a tree swaying in the wind until he found its eyes in the darkness. Those eyes! Those eyes! He cried as I tucked a blanket around his feet. His gaze never left the back door. He said he had watched it walk up to the trail that led from the woods to our porch and sat there watching. It looks like a tree, Martin. They look like trees, but they ain't trees. They ain't trees. He calmed down. I was able to rest for a while. I made a pot of coffee and flipped through the farm's logbook. The last coherent entry was from two months prior. He talked about the harvest, about how something seemed to spook the cows, how two of the seasonal workers he had hired had left for lunch and then never come back. He mentioned seeing a human figure moving in the forest and how he planned on investigating once he finished his dinner. I could feel the desperation in his writing that he hoped it was my mother and that she'd finally come home to him. I had come to terms with the fact that she was gone, but apparently he had not. Why did you kill the chickens? It had been a statement rather than a question. He seemed to have come down out of the mania he'd been in the night prior, and I was hoping for some answers. I was hoping he'd tell me a coyote or mountain lion was to blame, but the look he gave me across the table struck me with unease. I'm trying to feed it so she comes back. It won't need her anymore if I feed it. Cows are next if need be. It wasn't that he said it, but how he said it, that it didn't sit right with me. Don't get me wrong, it was a crazy thing to say at all, but he said it as if he were discussing something he'd read in the paper. Dad, she's not out there, and if she is, she isn't alive. I tried to maintain my calm, but I felt the air get tense, and he firmly set down his coffee cup. Do not talk back to me, boy. He slammed his fist on the table and pushed his chair back. Picking up his keys, he said, I will not be patronized in my own house. If you ain't going to help, then get out. That was the last time I saw my father. His truck was found a couple of days later, caked in a layer of snow, parked along the 206, keys still in the ignition. The sheriff conducted his three-day search and came up with nothing, and I was told, in a hush, to take care of my father's affairs. I put my education on permanent hold and resigned to spend the rest of the year combing through his papers. Two nights after the search, I woke up in a freezing house. It was so cold. It was so familiar, and I cautiously walked out into the living room. Two nights after the search, I woke up in a freezing cold house. It's so familiar, and I cautiously walked out into the living room. Every door and window stood open to the night air. The power was out. But the fresh snow reflected enough light from the full moon that I was able to see. I quickly closed the front door and the windows, recycling the motions of the years prior. I was shut in the back door when I noticed something that chilled me colder than the weather even could. My father was standing at the trail head, his naked body a pale blue and he was waving, a large somewhat twisted smile on his face and there was something off about the way he was standing but I couldn't place it. A trail of red footprints ran from the back porch, and when I shouted at him to get in the house, he didn't respond. He just continued to wave. I was pulling on my boots to run out to him when something caught the corner of my eye. Something long and disjointed. It was just beyond where the moonlight illuminated the tree line. It was then that my father slumped down onto his knees, still waving and smiling, seemingly unaware of his new position, and the creature emerged ever so slightly from the darkness. I could finally see the eyes that had haunted my father, two white reflections gazing at me from the height that would have been impossible for any human. It was exactly as my father had described. Pale, limbs that looked like branches, joints that looked like wood knots. 
I heard a low groan over the snow, and the creature emerged a little further. My father began lurching forward into the snow, face down, arms still waving. Its head resembled a wooden horse skull, bare of any flesh but home to an uneven row of sharp teeth. Steam flowed out of its mouth into the cold air, something wet dripping from its teeth. I only ever saw its arms and head. I couldn't move, and I can't remember if it was due to the fright or just the grotesqueness of it all. The furnace kicking in brought me back to reality. I blinked for what felt like the first time in a while and realised that the morning sun was low in the sky. The back door was shut and locked, though I hadn't closed it, and I was wearing a single snow boot. The footprints were no longer there, and there were no puddles of melted snow under any of the windows. For a long time I tried to convince myself it was all a very bad dream, but I can't hide from it anymore. In the years since this incident, I've sold most of the farm to people looking to build houses. I have no desire to run a farm anymore. Recently, the new neighbours have been asking me if I ever seen anything strange in the woods. That one of their kids was sure something was watching them from just beyond the tree line. Something moving in the darkness. I know there is something in that forest. Something that has waited ten years and for the snow to come so it can strike and there is nothing I can do to stop it. I gave them what information I have about the woods, told them what I've seen, but they're from out of town and have probably filled me away as a crazy local. That's fine. I did my diligence. I'm renting out my house this winter, so I'm not here for it. The Great White Ape of Sherwood Forest, MD. Let's get straight into that. What I'm about to tell you is an event that happened nine years ago in Sherwood Forest, MD. A small, private community that resides in the state's capital of Annapolis. Names are abbreviated to initials to hide identities. This community is, well, in its own world, so to speak. The community breeds rich, affluent and beautiful people each generation, most with almost unnatural perfectly blonde hair. This community is known for two things mostly. Fireworks on the 3rd of July. Yes, the 3rd. It's just another way the Sherwood likes to be different. And the Boys and Girls Summer Camp, where people travel all over the country, and sometimes the world, to a place where they can relax and have their kids be watched over for them. There isn't much to say about the place. There has only ever been one known bad accident where someone had passed. It was a cool late June night where the breeze was ever so perfect. A boy who will remain anonymous at the age of 15 was left near one of the docks after a night of heavy drinking. And it was not until the next morning, it was where his corpse was found face down in the water. Now, I say bad mainly because the incident is explainable. An intoxicated miner drowned unsupervised. What's strange is that the incident is mostly looked over, but an urban legend around Sherwood is taken more seriously. The Great White Ape It's common knowledge that this story is used by the older campers to scare the other ones. But even the older campers around 16 or so are also scared of the story themselves. Near the corner of the boundaries of Sherwood Forest lies Brewer's Pond, a shallow, smaller patch of water that leads to a mountainous island that is technically not an island because it connects to land, but due to the rock and snake infested waters, it is best to travel there by boat or kayak. For my camp group, we loved to travel to this island every time we had a chance. We had kayaking on our schedule about once every one or two weeks, and we always did one thing, go to the island and rustle. It was a blast, especially for the group of nine to ten year old boys. One time, on the day that we were kayaking, my small group of friends called me over to talk quick before we headed to the island. Apparently two of them found this one mudslide down further down the island while out on one of their boats yesterday. It had just rained the night before and the terrain was perfect to slide down. I didn't really want to go because I really liked wrestling. But since they were mainly the only people I talked to in our huge group of 22, which is a lot of people for a group in Sherwood, 
I had no choice but to go with them. A five-man group including me, CP, CS, JP and JC. Heading out to the part of the island was honestly quite exciting for elementary school boys. It was an adventure in the heat of summer and felt very nostalgic. Sure enough, they weren't lying. As we stood before a massive mudslide, which had to be at least 25 feet up a hill. And of course, being the children we were, we went straight for it. It was insanely fun for the first few rounds, and I even forgot about wrestling and just said screw it. It was the perfect day for this, blue skies after a rainy night. And the river had a gorgeous dark blue glow in the mid-afternoon sun. Things quickly went south. CS, who had been the wildest out of all of us, decided to go all the way to the top of the hill for his next turn. Just before he went down, I noticed something somewhat strange. Next to him in the shrubbery, erupted in shaking. I think everyone but CS noticed, but they all shrugged it off as a squirrel or something. Although it was way too big of a shake for it to be that of a small animal. As CS went down, he tripped immediately. His fall was eerie to say the least. The parabolic angle of his fall down the slanted hill magically hit the bottom perpendicularly, where his kneecaps smashed into a rock. The bone breaking was audible, even for me, who had to have been standing at least 15 feet away. CS burst into tears, and no one could blame him except for me, who thought it was stupid for him to go up there in the first place. But he was my friend, and like the rest of us, we immediately went over to our kayaks to bring CS back. But when we went back to check on them, we were shocked. One paddle was missing entirely, and two others were badly damaged near the ends, with one end being torn down halfway. There was a string of sharp-edged rocks nearby that would explain that, and although I'm not sure how the tides could manage to pull so hard on them, we couldn't paddle back with only two good paddles, three kayaks and five people. The two strongest of the group, me and CP, could probably only manage to bring one other back with our strength. We attempted to bring CS back with us so he could get immediate attention, but he was too heavy, and the general ergonomics of the kayak left his knee in an awkward position. We had no other choice. We left JP with CS and brought back JC since he was the smallest. It was already almost 5pm when we should have been back an hour ago and quickly hurried back to the pier. We couldn't get back to the island for a while after trying to find a counsellor who could take us back to buy boats. Even though they all knew the urgency of the situation, only some had their boats in license. As we swung around the corner of the island to where we were, only CS was there, still on the ground as expected. But he wasn't okay, and I'm not just talking about his leg. His whole body was white, as if he had seen a ghost. We asked where JP was, but he didn't answer. We looked around for a solid five minutes with no luck and no help from CS. We shrugged it off. It's not like he could have gone anywhere far, and the island is close by boat. The focus was on CS for now, who desperately needed medical attention. CS was brought back to the ambulance, waiting for him. All of our parents were there, waiting on us, including JP's parents. The counsellor talked to them in private as the rest of us went home. All horribly exhausted, and ride for CS but also JP, who was now getting the attention from the older counsellors, to go get checked on. It wasn't until the next morning that we were able to hear anything back from the two of them. CS had broken a kneecap that went entirely through the bone, and we wouldn't be seeing him at camp for the rest of the summer. As for JP, it was much, much worse than we thought. According to the police report, at approximately 4.15am, his body was found face down in the water, in Brewer's Pond. That's when it hit me. I knew something was off. Jogging my memory, I remember that CS tripping felt odd. He didn't trip on the ground. It felt more like he was almost pulled down mid-air. The movement was so fast that I couldn't recognize it at the time, and CS getting hurt switched my focus. Later that day at camp, JC spoke up too. He saw it. He didn't know what it was at the time, but he said, that he saw a white, furry arm come out of the bush and ignored it as well. Unfortunately, no one believed us, and we were no longer with CS to ask his accounts of the situation, or what happened when we left the island. This was all nine years ago, 
I haven't seen CS since the incident and still don't know for sure what happened or if that event was tied into the other boy's death. What I can say is, if you hear about the great white ape in Sherwood Forest, MD, please take it seriously.